Hi, I'm Rick Bicata, Medical Director of the National Emergency Medicine Board Review. Here's what to expect in 2019. So please consider attending the National Emergency Medicine Board Review. We've been doing it a long time. We feel real confident in what we're doing. We have a fabulous faculty, great updated content. So entrust us with your studying for the exam. It's part of what you'll be doing. I know you'll be glad you took the course. Thanks for listening and bye for now. So as you drift on in, I introduce myself. I'm Diane Berenbaumer. I just flew in this after this sort of noon time. Um, and I wanted to let you know I feel your pain. Um, I took this exam last year. I took my concert last year. Um, I have to tell you a couple things about it when I took it. It was more reasonable than I expected. Um, the things that I didn't know, I probably should have known. Um, and there wasn't a lot that was kind of tried to fool you. It was, it was pretty straightforward, especially for the concert, those of you that are recertifying. It, it was really honestly the kind of things that you see mainly in your practice. There weren't a lot of sort of trip you up kind of things. For those of you taking the qualifying exam, um, I didn't retake that obviously, but it tends to be a little bit more in depth, but I have to tell you, it was a, it was a reasonable exam. So, and, and the other thing I want to tell you is that you guys are really smart. You have done this before, right? Those of you that are taking the, re, the re, recertifying exam, the concert, you passed this before. So you can do it again. There's no question that you can do it again. And if you stand back and think about it, what I really want you to do right now is pat yourself on the back. Because look at that book that's sitting in front of you. And look at what you're sitting in your, you're, you're sitting here for what, 12 hours a day. That you know this stuff. It is amazing what you know to do what you do. So I want you to pat yourself on the back. You do a good job every single day where you work. You know this stuff. And it, 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 just, it is remarkable. I'm just flabbergasted. And every time I go through this book or I go through this sort of the review of the things that we need to know for our job, I am amazed the human body works normally ever. Right? It is amazing that most people are walking around with everything working the way it's supposed to. It is an incredibly miraculous and complex sort of box that we're walking around in. And we're picking apart in bits and pieces to talk about how things go wrong and how to diagnose them and how to make them better. But it is just an incredible amount of information that you all know. So trust yourself that you do. Focus on the stuff that you know, or your, you know, each of us has our little bugaboo. The things, I have certain things in talks I can never remember. I peds things drive me crazy, rashes, I hate them. So there's things that I had to go back and restudy. All of us have that. But trust that you know this stuff, because you do. You practice it every day, so you do. So now, that's the beginning of this. And now my disclaimer. If we haven't already completely eradicated any molecule of libido in your body, by having you sit here this long, I'm gonna kill off the last molecule with this talk. So we're gonna talk about OBGYN, but what we're gonna basically talk about in the first sort of 20 minutes or so, almost half an hour, is sexually transmitted infections. So we're gonna be talking a lot about STIs. What I wanna do in talking about these is I wanna divide them into two major categories. So if you think about someone who comes in with a complaint of something going on down there, and this, about this there may be a little bit of overlap in this talk with what Stuart talked about. So some of these things you're gonna hear sort of a, probably again, but with a little bit of a different twist because we'll talk a little bit from, from the pe female perspective. But think about the problems down there dividing instantly into two major categories. One is the things that can cause ulcers down there, sores down there, and the other is the thing that can cause drips down there. So if you divide it in half, you start there with that being your first branch point, you're going to have a whole sort of easy ease over into one section. We're going to start with the ulcerating STIs. Now, a couple of things to know. When someone comes in with sores down there, assume in the emergency department that it's a sexually transmitted infection. And the ones that we're going to think we're going to talk about are syphilis, herpes, chancroid, and LGV. We're also going to talk about a few of the other things on this list, but know that there are other things that can cause lesions down there. When I took my internal medicine boards, I'm board certified in both, when I took my internal medicine boards a billion years ago, what they really were interested in if somebody had lesions down there was Bichette's disease, because that's what people in internal medicine kind of need to add on their list. We don't. 
So if, so if someone has sores down there, you're going to think about ulcerating STIs. That's what we're going to think about. So let's get into what those are. Let's start with syphilis. Now, syphilis is a fascinating disorder. Just as a little historical perspective, we had never, as a human kind, we had never seen syphilis until 1493. For, and 1493, which is awfully near 1492, and those of you who remember what happened in 1492. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And the, th the theory is that Columbus and his guys all came over to the Dominican Republic, which is where they landed, and when they got off the ship after three months at sea together, all guys, they were interested in a lot of sort of things that were happening on the island, including perhaps a little woohoo, and they took back with them syphilis. So syphilis hadn't hit the European continent until 1493, and it basically killed a third of the people that got it. Killed them. Killed them. Clean, ugly, nasty, awful, oozing sores, just killed about a third of them. What this disorder is, is a treponemal-born disease. So it's that little spiral treponeme thing that basically drills its way into you when you get infected. So if you were to walk down the strip today, and those, you've got those little cards that go flick it, chicky, 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 as you walk down the street, right? They flick those little cards at you with the women that have little stars on their little private parts. They, they, and so if you were to pick up one of those and make a phone call today, and have a little woohoo here in Las Vegas. Well, what happened is in about two to four weeks, if you picked up syphilis today, you would get a shanker. What's happening is that spirochete is drilling its way into, you, into wherever it was contacting your skin. So that can be anywhere. It's usually genitalia. So penis for the men, vagina, sort of external genitalia for the women. But it could be anywhere. It could be your mouth. It could be your hand. It could be any place you're inoculated. And it's about two to four weeks. So you would leave the end of July here. And at the end of August, you're going to end up with a shanker. Now, it's usually solitary. It's usually painless. It doesn't drain. Okay, it's just a solitary shanker at the site of inoculation. If you were to do a dark field microscopy on that particular thing, you might show the spirochete, but nobody does dark fields anymore. That's almost an antique study these days. But if you were to draw the blood test to see if somebody has syphilis, it takes a while for those blood tests to turn positive. So even if somebody has a primary shanker, they may not have a positive blood test yet. They're getting the antibodies sort of developing in their system. So they may not have, a, it's about 80% of the time-ish, they'll have a positive blood test, but it may not be positive at the time of the primary shanker. So your, your, your serology tests, the blood tests, may be negative during early syphilis, during the sort of shanker stage of syphilis. This is that little bugger on the left that's drilling its way into wherever it's inoculated, again, often on the penis, female genitalia, external, or actually even on the cervix. But what if you perform oral sex on someone or have oral sex with somebody that has syphilis? You're going to get the lesion on your mouth. You can get it on your hand. You can get it anywhere it's inoculated. Now, the good news is you say, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I'm just going to ignore it. Well, it goes away, except it kind of doesn't. What happens now is the spirochete starts to swim all around your body, and what it causes is about two to 10 weeks later, so here's your chicky, chicky, chicky day, you go have your little trice today. At the end of August, you have your, your, your shanker, you try to ignore it, it goes away. But now come Halloween, you wake up and you now have a rash on your body. You have a rash on your palms, you have a rash on your soles. You have this maculopapular rash that often looks sort of annular in shape and often Christmas tree shaped, which should remind you of something you probably heard about yesterday, which is pityriasis rosea. So pityriasis rosea is this truncal rash that looks like a Christmas tree, while secondary syphilis can look exactly the same. But while that spirochete is kind of traipsing around your body, you can get fevers low-grade fever is nothing usually very high. You get my myalgias and arthralgias. You can have as the sort of lesions down on the genitalia kind of form, they can get condylomalata. You get actually some, some condylomatous lesions down in the genitalia area, and you get diffuse lymphadenopathy in the secondary stage. Again, what's happening is that spirochete is drifting all around your body, swimming all over the place, going all kinds of places in your body. So it makes sense that you have systemic symptoms that may go along with this. Eventually, that will go away, because if you decide to ignore it, Usually within a couple of weeks, it will go away. So by, I don't know, Thanksgiving, it's all gone. And you are whew, home free. Your little chicky, chicky, chicky night in Vegas didn't cause any long-term trouble, except it does. Because now the spirochete is hanging around in your body, and it's just waiting. And over the course of many, many years, it can cause some trouble we'll talk about in a second. So this is how you're going to wake up on Halloween. 
if you have your acquisition today. You're going to wake up with this, this body rash. It's maculopapular, often annular shaped. It can involve your palms. It can involve your soles. And if you were to shake hands with that person, that's contagious. So you can actually pick up the, the, the syphilitic sort of infection, even from those lesions. That's contagious. And even more contagious than that is that same rash, but on the tongue. So these are called mucus patches. And if you look really close at that picture, like really, really close, you can see the spirochetes jumping off, <laughs> waiting to infect you. Because that is that's a moist part of your body that is phenomenally infectious, incredibly infectious. Now, down in the genital region, they can cause these flat warts called condylomalata, and these are also very, very infectious. The problem with condylomalata, though, is sometimes it can look a lot like HPV, which is condyloma acuminata, which is HPV-type warts. It's difficult in the genital region to tell the difference one from the other sometimes, so don't count on your sort of clinical acumen to say, oh, yeah, it's HPV, or oh, no, I think it's, it's condylomalata. Put it together as a, sort of a big picture. Now, that, that latent stage, while it's kind of hanging around your body, what can happen is anywhere from 3 to 25 years later, what it's done is it's been doing its damage kind of low grade that whole time. I'll tell you one of the reasons we know so much about what happens at the, sort of that latent to tertiary stage is from the Tuskegee study. And if you haven't heard about the Tuskegee study, you need to either read a book called Bad Blood or Netflix or stream the HBO production Miss Evers Boys. Because we basically had an experiment down in the South where African American men who were infected with syphilis were let to go decades untreated, even after we knew there was treatment available, to see, kind of, just to sort of watch the natural history of the disease. And what this does is it makes you crazy, it gives you tabes dorsalis, it gives you aortitis, it gives you gummitous lesions, it is a horrific problem long term. It basically can give you things called Charcot's joints. That's a, that basically erodes away your joints, often because you just can't feel things right. This is basically a leap, you know, sort of, um, sort of tissue that builds up in your, in your skin there from lymphoid tissue. Here's a gumma itself. And these, this picture in the middle, like, it looks like Ben Affleck. I don't know if he knows that, but <laughs> it looks an awful lot like Ben Affleck. These are people with tertiary syphilis. And the woman on the right in that picture, if you were to put your hand on that thing, on her sternum, it's pulsatile. And the reason that's pulsatile is that is basically syphilitic aortitis, which was a common cause of death when, when syphilis was untreated in the 19-teens and 1920s. Remarkable, that, that death certificate right there is basically somebody who died of syphilitic aortitis. Now, to diagnose it, uh, now remember, at the very beginning Schenker stage, these tests may not be positive yet, but by the time you're in your secondary stage, you should be able to diagnose them serologically. Now, serologic tests come in two flavors. The VDRL or the RPR are tests that aren't specific to the treponeme. They're actually some, a, a reaction your body has to the treponeme. It's not specific to the treponeme, but it is something we can follow for activity of disease. So the RPR and the VDRL are non-specific tests that are suggestive of syphilis, but they're false positives in other conditions, but suggestive of syphilis, and that titer will rise and fall based on activity of disease. If you've treated it and they're cured, it should go to zero. The FTA, which is basically the confirmatory specific test to, to the treponeme itself, that we use as a confirmatory test, and its titers don't respond to go down to zero. You're actually positive for life once you've gotten syphilis once. So the, so the test of these two that we follow for activity of disease is the non-treponemal test. The treponemal test is a confirmatory test. Now, when you have somebody that has syphilis, so they, you, they come in, they have a shanker, they have syphilis, what you're going to also do is test them for HIV, because once you've broken the skin with some sort of sexually transmitted infection, you now are at risk for any other kind of infection that's transmitted through breaks in skin like HIV. So HIV is recommended to basically test for in people with syphilis, and then you treat this with penicillin. Now, syphilis has been around since 1493, as far as we know, and it is the dumbest organism I can think of. You whiff a little bit of penicillin in its direction, and it just withers and dies. If you have a lot of treponemes in your body, oh, by the way, treating primary and secondary, it's basically a single dose. Okay, you get onto tertiary, it's more than one dose. But basically, penicillin, penicillin, penicillin. That's the absolute drug to choose. There's some options as well if you're panallergic, but pen is really the treatment of choice. Now, if you happen to have secondary syphilis, so you've got a lot of, of spirochetes in your system, and now I hit you with penicillin. What can happen is all those spirochetes die at the same time. And when they do, you get a pyrogenic reaction. You basically get myalgias, arthralgias, and fevers that can spike as high as 104 or 105. 
So that's called the jaris herxheimer reaction. It's a very testable question. So know that it's something that is, is very tempting for test writers to write a question about. And they become, in, basically you have to warn people. If they have secondary syphilis, you give them their shot of penicillin, warn them that they may end up with arthralgias, myalgias, and a fever. And I have to tell you a great story about this. When I was an internal medicine resident, our second year of internal medicine residency, we had to spend a month as the medicine consult service to the surgeons. The orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, all the surgeons would call us with things like, what do I do with the sugar of 126? What do I do with the blood pressure of 160 over 100? It drove you insane. By the end of that month, I was ready to shoot myself. But right near the end of the month, I got a call in the middle of the night. And they said, you've got to, you've got to come down to the recovery room. You, you've got to come down here. This guy is septic as all get out. We don't know what to do. He's spiked to temperature. He's 105. You've got to come down here. Like, okay. So I go traipsing down to the recovery room. And what I'm greeted with is a bed in which is lying this ginormously jockish 19-year-old guy with one leg and a long leg cast. And is otherwise, he's covered with a sheet. With rigoring, temperature 105, surrounded by a whole bunch of very concerned looking orthopedists. What I noticed when he was covered with the sheet is that on his, the sole of his foot was a rash. And when I kind of pulled the sheet down, on his torso was a rash. And on his foot, hand was a rash. And what he'd had before he went to the operating room to have his open tib fib fracture basically fixed in the operating room is he'd gotten pen oxygen IV. It was the best revenge ever to turn to them and say, oh, did you, did you touch him with no gloves on? <gasps> that's syphilis that's on his rash, and yes, he's having the Jairus Herxheimer reaction. Boom, it was great. <laughs> it is 30 years later, and I am still loving that story. Gotta love it. So you will never forget the Jairus Herxheimer reaction. That's what the Jairus Herxheimer reaction is. Now, I want you to also know something before I get into this. I want you to sort of take a moment and sort of go within. And then look at your neighbor on your right. And look at your neighbor on your left. Look at the person in front of you. And look at the person behind you. Because one of the five of you has herpes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's true. So one in five people in North America test positive for basically HSV2. And the reality is a lot of people acquire it without even know they, knowing they got it. So a lot of people that have HSV2 don't know they have it. One in five sexually active adults has it. Now it is an incurable disease. So the prevalence is high, right? The incidence, which is the new, new, new infection, is actually pretty stable. It's not that super you know, crazy. But once you have it, you have it. Okay, so the, and the problem with this is, if you've never had HSV before, so you've never had a cold sore, you've never had genital herpes, never before, and you pick up your chicky 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 card today, and you get herpes today, what's gonna happen is, because you have no antibodies of any kind in your system, you are gonna get sick. What you get, basically, is a systemic illness. You acquire the, the infection genitally, you get viremic with this, and so you'll get a low-grade fever and aches and pains, and you just, you're acting very viral for about a week. So you're gonna get home next week, and next weekend, what you're gonna do is you're gonna wake up after having been viral all day that, you know, for the week, couple days before, and you're gonna have sores down there. Now, if you're a guy, you may see blisters first. So you may notice a bunch of little blisters that then basically ulcerate pretty early. For women, because we don't get really blisters there, they basically denude pretty early, you get lots and lots of lesions down there. They're shallow, they're multiple, they're incredibly painful, miserably painful. They, you also may get some adenopathy, which is just sort of shoddy rubbery nodes, not big ginormous nodes. Those lesions down there are gonna last another week to 10 days, so now you're two weeks from now, and you're not gonna completely heal and get back to normal for about three weeks. So if you've never been exposed to herpes before and you pick it up that way, that's basically the course of the illness. It's pretty miserable. So here are the lesions that have actually ulcerated. The picture on the left is a bunch of them on the, on the glands and the shaft. The picture on the right there is a woman who's got multiple lesions that are, get painful, shallow ulcerations. What happens with this is, and, the, and it does go away. The problem is that it doesn't get cured. So the virus basically now moves in and lives in your body. And where it lives in your body is your sacral plexus. It goes down and just hunkers down and lives there for life. 
what happens is most people will get recurrences. So now this is basically the, the virus is there, and now it has, for whatever reason, you go out in the sun, you're stressed out because you're stuttering, studying for your board exam, you've had a fight with your loved one, something. You have menstrual cycles. For some women, it's every menstrual cycle. They'll basically have a recurrence that will occur. Now these are different. It's not systemically ill. It's already in you. It basically comes out, and they may have a little prodrome. It's a little bit burning. It's a little tingling. It might be a little itchy. And then they come up with just a couple of lesions that are shorter lasting and they tend to go away more quickly. So, but recurrences are, are the rule. 90% of people who are symptomatic with the first acquisition of infection will end up with a symptomatic occurrence. And again, they often have a prodrome that goes with this. Shedding the virus, you can shed the virus, in fact, everyone sheds the virus when they are symptomatic. You can also shed the virus when you're asymptomatic. So people may have no idea they have herpes, may shed the virus, and you don't shed a ton, but you can shed a little bit, and now your sexual partner can pick it up. It's just one of the reasons that one in five of us has, has antibodies to HSV2. You diagnose this particular disorder usually clinically. So that's the scenario. Somebody's been sexually active, they have multiple you know, shallow painful ulcers, they've had a little viremic phase. You, you basically diagnose it clinically. The CDC, though, recommends that you actually try to do some sort of testing to confirm it, particularly in women of childbearing age. It's a big problem if there's a woman who is pregnant, peri-delivery, who has an outbreak of genital herpes because it's devastating for the child. So to diagnose this, if you need to do testing, if you're not going to just make a clinical diagnosis, you really want to say, is it really herpes or not? Basically, it's PCR testing that's recommended. We used to try to do cell cultures. It's not so great. Zank, zank smears, which are really antique, just don't work at all. So the best way for this is to do a viral PCR. Now, as if it weren't bad enough to have the lesions down in the genital area. In people that have that initial acquisition viremic thing, that three-week illness, about 10% will go on and get a meningitis. So as the virus is traipsing around your body, it goes to your meninges and can cause a true meningitis. And that tends to be about day 10-ish, so the lesions are start, or see, a little bit later. So as the lesions are starting to heal, you get this headache. It's classic meningitis. Headache, photophobia, neck stiffness. The CSF is positive, usually lymphocytes, not polys, lymphocytes for this. You can get urinary retention. So when that virus starts to hunker down in your sacral plexus, it basically gives you autonomic dysfunction. So especially women who have a whole lot of lesions down there, they may end up unable to pee without capping. And that may last as long as 10 weeks. So that urinary retention is a problem. You can even get emultiforme. There are a few other rarer things, but, but know that meningitis is one in 10, one in 10 when you get the, the infection initially. To treat herpes, you can use acyclovir, valacyclovir, famcyclovir. The veers work, okay? The veers absolutely work. They control the symptoms. They basically decrease the, the duration of the initial illness. That sort of 31 day or 21 day thing shrinks down. You can, you can shorten the recurrences and actually even prevent them. So some people end up on suppressive therapy. Somebody who has, for women that have every menstrual cycle, they get an outbreak, those women offer put on, put on suppressive therapy so that they don't end up with recurrences. Another, for those of us that are a little grayer on the temples, if any of you in this room has herpes, know that as time goes by, the recurrence rate decreases, the, the, the incidence of it, the number of times you recur. So the first year, almost everybody has at least one. Um, as time goes by, it will get longer and longer and longer between recurrences. That tends to happen as you get older, as far as recurrences are concerned. Now, the, the reason that the CDC gets so crazy about trying to test and confirm the diagnosis in women of childbearing age is that if the baby acquires herpes, it's one of the torch infections. Now, you heard about the torch infections with derm. You're going to hear about it again in peds. Torch infections are devastating absolutely devastating. It is the H of torch, and basically if, a, if an infant acquires herpes, they have a 50% mortality, and they have a 90% morbidity in the ones who survive. So it is a, and it's completely preventable. If a woman has an outbreak near the time of delivery, doing a cesarean section, is prevent, it prevents the infection in the, in, in the infant. So it's super, super important in women of childbearing age. So if you, if you, at home, forget the boards, at home if you diagnose a young woman with herpes, please make sure she knows to tell her OBGYN in the future that she's had a diagnosis of herpes if she ever gets pregnant. This is what can happen around the anal region. Again, herpes can get, you can get an infection anywhere. This is if you happen to acquire it anally. Now, there's another, another infection, two others actually, that can cause lesions of the genitalia. So we, we talk, we're talking about the sores down there. Syphilis was the first one we talked about. 
that's not the most common of the, the ulcerative ones. Herpes is the most common of the ulcerative ones. We're going to get down to the really rare in the U.S. kind of disorders. One is chancroid. On this slide, what I want you to circle is unilateral adenopathy bubo. If somebody comes in with multiple painful genital ulcers and they have a big, nasty, gnarly, fluctuant lymph node, that is chancroid toe proven otherwise. It is exceedingly rare in the United States. We had three small outbreaks where I work in my duration, my 30 years where I, where I worked. But the, if you travel overseas, you're going to see this in developing countries. So it is a bubo with painful genital ulcers. It is very treatable. You can treat it with ceftriaxone. You don't have to open the bubo. Okay, it usually will resolve on its own. And this is a gram-negative organism. It's a gram-negative bacillus. It's hard to culture. You'll never culture this. This is a presumptive diagnosis with that big ginormous lymph node and multiple painful ulcers. So that's all you need to know about chancroid. There's a, th these are some of the lesions that can occur. They tend to be multiple painful, not quite like this. This is the other one that can cause genital ulcers. But I have to tell you, LGV is a little different. Now, LGV is caused by chlamydia, and it is the same, it's a different serotype, but it's a different, it's, it's the same chlamydia that we think about when we think of chlamydia, chlamydia trachomatis. This is actually also rare in the United States, but where we see this in the U.S. is mainly in men who have sex with men. There have been two outbreaks in the last five years or so, and one in New York, and I think the other is in Wisconsin, of men who have sex with men. And what they'll do, they do get an ulcer, when they get the initial infection. The problem with that, though, is the ulcer is tiny. It doesn't really cause much symptoms in and of itself, and it tends to go away. But what they'll come in with instead is no ulcers, but they'll have a lymph node. They'll have basically on, on usually one side, sometimes both, but usually one side, they'll end up with kind of matted large nodes, usually above and below the inguinal ligament, and that's called the groove sign. They're not fluctuant, they're large, they tend to be a little bit tender, and, they, and the reason they're important is that they scar, they tend to heal with scarring. And if they scar, people get lymphedema, ginormous lymphedema. So the ulcers are not how they usually present. They present with basically this lymphadenopathy with a groove sign. They may have some you know, systemic symptoms, but usually not, actually. Usually they just have the groove sign itself. This is a chlamydial diagnosis, so you can diagnose it like any other chlamydia. The thing to know that's different about treating this particular chlamydial infection is that this one is a three-week course. So that's another thing to kind of circle as far as something on that slide that's particularly important. It's a three-week course, not a single dose. This is what we do with you know, your usual chlamydia that doesn't cause this. But this is a three-week course to cure it. So this is the groove sign. Okay, this is basically adenopathy above and below the ligament. It is rarely huge. It's not that huge fluctuant node like chancroid is. This is basically just localized. It can get large-ish, but it tends to be above and below the ligament. And if you don't treat it right, they end up with basically all this sort of matting, and it can open and ooze, and just it's a mess. It's a mess. So the key is to, to recognize this. And again, rare in the U.S., but men who have sex with men are the two pools. It's the pool that tends to transmit this when they have outbreaks. Here is the slide that if you want one slide that puts everything on it, that you want to just go back and cram the, the ulcerative STIs, it's all there for you, including treatment. So this, this is the money slide for you. You can put a big circle around it. If you want to go cram it in at the last minute, there's your ulcerative lesion slide. Let's scooch away from the sores and let's go to the drips, the things that can cause actually sort of things that cause drips down there. Now, this is a long, long list, and it, anything from sexually transmitted infections to those that aren't actually sexually transmitted that, that are the vulva vaginity. So let's break these down and go through these in order. And let's start with chlamydia. Now, chlamydia, the same one we just talked about, the LGV chlamydia, there's a different, ser different serotypes, but this is chlamydia trachomatis that is the most common STD. Okay, and actually, STI is the technically correct term, a sexually transmitted infection. This is, this, I'll tell you, this little bugger has been around for a while. It lives in your cells. It doesn't live on your cells. It lives in your cells. It causes low-grade inflammatory kind of stuff, and it is the reason that you either are or know someone who's infertile. It, is a, it, has been, it just has been wreaking havoc in the upper female genital tract of a lot of women for a long time because it gets up there without causing a ton of symptoms. In fact, women can get this infection completely asymptomatically, completely asymptomatically. So if you are symptomatic when you get this infection, for men, it tends to cause dysuria or a discharge, okay? And the discharge tends to be just clear, okay? It's not purulent, it's just clear. It's not usually both. 
um, the women may have some dysuria as well. They can get a urethritis just like men can. Women tend to get a cervicitis, but the cervicitis is relatively mild. It's not a big, angry, nasty cervix. It tends to be relatively mild. And it can get up into the upper genital tract and cause PID, which is where all the havoc is wreaked with this particular organism. Men can get epididymitis, they can get orchitis, again, relatively rare with chlamydia. It can happen, definitely, but not that common. So it, it, it is really just a kind of mild infection that causes all kinds of long-term trouble. If you were to pick it up today, the infection part of this takes about one to three weeks. But honestly, remember, many people have minimal symptoms with this, hardly any at all. And the people that are the biggest concern about this tend to be sexually active adolescents, adolescents and young adults, because they're at risk for having long-term complications of this particular infection, and they can pass it around pretty easily. That one of the times to think about this, particularly in women, is, what it, with, is when they present with what's called sterile pyuria. So this is a woman who comes in and she says to you, um, it burns when I pee. No, I don't have urgency. No, I don't have frequency. It burns when I pee. Okay, you get a urine, and the urine shows white cells. Okay, nitrite negative shows white cells. She sounds like she's got a UTI. Treat her for a UTI. Give her three days of whatever. You send her back. She comes back again, and she says, no, 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 it still burns when I pee. You get a urine. It still shows white cells. It's still nitrite negative. You either increase the duration of the antibiotics or you switch to another antibiotic to cover a UTI, and she's still symptomatic. The reason, for the re the reason she is still pyuric and symptomatic, not urgency frequency, it's not cystitis, it's urethritis, it's dysuria. The reason she has that is she has chlamydial urethritis. Okay, men get that with their urethra is just longer. Women can get it as well. So if you see that, you're going to have to switch. You're going to do an NAAT to check for chlamydia, and you're going to switch her to something that will actually treat chlamydia, like azithro. Azithro is not a drug we use to treat UTIs. That's why it would be a failure of a UTI treatment, because it's not a UTI. It's actually urethritis. So diagnosing chlamydia is basically nucleic acid amplification testing. Okay, you can use urine, it's just fine. For women, the yield is a little bit better if you get a cervical swab, but as far as the cervicitis part. But for men, it's, you have them pee in a cup, it's absolutely fine. It is very accurate, it's a really good test. And the treatment for this is either azithro or doxy. Azithro, single dose, doxy for a week. Okay, easy to treat. The key is to diagnose it and pick it up. Gonorrhea, on the other hand, is an entirely different organism. Gonorrhea is, excuse me, but badass. Gonorrhea does nasty, nasty stuff. So this is the chicky, chicky, chicky card. You have your little tryst this evening. First of all, if your partner that you're having a little tryst with is, has gonorrhea, it's basically a revolver with two chambers and one bullet. You have a 50-50 chance with a single sexual encounter for picking up gonorrhea. It is very infectious. And you may be symptomatic by the last day of this course. Okay, it is something, it is really, it is, it is mad. This thing is nasty business. So one in 50, 50, 50 chance of getting it, and your incubation period is less than a week. So for two to seven days, really, really fast. Maybe two weeks, but usually two to seven days. Basically, this is, it is, and if women get this and they don't get treated for gonorrhea, basically one in five are going to get PID, and that is bad PID. That's the 1960s PID. That's the febrile PID shuffle kind of PID because they're so peritoneal. It is a nasty thing. So when people get gonorrhea, what they'll get for women, women tend to get a discharge that's different from their basic discharge, or they'll get post spotting. They'll have sex and they'll spot. It's like, what's up with that? That's weird. I've never spot after sex. What's that? Well, what's happening is while you're having sex, your very friable cervix is getting irritated and it starts to basically bleed a little bit. That's the spotting that happens for women that get cervicitis. And it's up there that's the infection. So you may have a little discharge that's different or you may have basically spotting after sex. For men, the description is peeing glass. Basically, for men, it is basically, it, it, you can get a lot of discharge. In fact, so much discharge. I took care of a patient who came in wearing a condom. Should have worn it before. He was wearing it after because he had so much discharge, he was like collecting it in the end of the condom. It is a lot of discharge, and it's greenish, it's purulent, and it burns like a sun. It hurts to pee. It's miserable. So it is, it's with a vengeance angry. It's, 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 it, and men can get epididymitis, urethritis, but you can get it gets anywhere. You can get proctitis, you can get pharyngitis, you can get all kinds of stuff with this. And if it gets up in the upper female genital tract, it can cause all kinds of havoc up there. If you were to do a pelvic exam on a woman and you did your speculum and you saw that, 
That is pus coming from the end of cervix. That's gonorrhea till proven otherwise. But oh, other, by the way, look at that cervix. That is not a normal cervix, right? A normal cervix is nice and light pink and like uniformly colored. That is red and angry. And you can see why that cervix during intercourse could get traumatized and bleed a little bit. So that makes some sense why you would be spotting because that cervix is infected with gonorrhea. If you were to send a gram stain, and I will tell you the only instance you really want to consider sending a gram stain is if people get this into their eye and they come in with gonococcal conjunctivitis. If you were to send a gram stain, that's what it looks like. Tons and tons and tons of white cells and gram-negative intracellular diplococci. Okay, that is gonorrhea. That's what it looks like. Now, diagnosing it these days, we don't usually send cultures, although I will tell you the CDC likes us too because they can track sort of sensitivities. The reality is most of us will diagnose this with NAATs. You go ahead and send the nucleic acid, and just again, P is fine, swabs are a little bit better for women. That's, that's your sort of way of diagnosing it. The, um, I do want to mention, though, that the reason that we want to go ahead and still at least every once in a while send cultures and th is resist, this is a smart organism. This, it, when I told you that the spirochete of syphilis was dumb as a post. This is a really smart bug. It knows how to be resistant a multitude of ways. It's resistant using plasmids from other cells around it. It's resistant on its own because it imports quinolone resistance. It is, it is an amazingly smart organism. And in fact, there is an isolate of gonorrhea that initially was in the Philippines, and I think it's actually made it stateside, that is resistant to everything everything, including spectinomycin, everything, nothing treats it. Scary, scary stuff. So these days, so one of the things I recommend if you're treating gonorrhea is you're going to basically treat them with what the CDC says to do. And what the CDC says to do right now is to give in, in sort of uncomplicated gonorrhea, give a single dose of IM ceftriaxone 250 and a gram of azithromycin. That's not just to get the chlamydia that might be hanging out. That's to treat the gonorrhea. You need both drugs now to tre effectively treat gonorrhea. And the reason I recommend you stick with the CDC, so this is something don't memorize, it, but if you treat a lot of this stuff, you get quick at this, but look it up. The reason for that is as the sort of sensitivities change, the CDC is trying to keep ahead of this very smart organism, so know that things may change down the line, but that's the recommendation right now, both drugs to treat just the gonorrhea. Now, can you get gonorrhea elsewhere? Yes, you can. You can get it rectally. You can get it in your eyeball. This tends to be auto-inoculation. You'll see, hear about this in the opto lecture, but they come in with a really, really nasty-looking bacterial conjunctivitis. And if you miss it, if you say, oh, here's some, an uh, some antibiotic eye drops for your bacterial conjunctivitis, what's going to happen is they're going to get either a corneal ulcer, best scenario, or anophthalmitis and lose their eyeball, worst scenario. So this is something, that, and this is treated with ceftriaxone. It's not treated with drop, drops at all. So your job is to recognize GC conjunctivitis. It can cause pharyngitis. It definitely can cause PID. We'll spend some time on it in a second. But the other thing it can do is it can disseminate. Now, if you're a woman who picks up gonorrhea um, and you don't get treated, you have about a 3% chance, 1 in 30, of having this disseminate usually during your menstrual cycle. If you take everybody that gets gonorrhea, and so men also can disseminate, it's about half a percent in men. And what happens is it swims around your body, and it likes several places on purpose. It loves. It loves synovium. So it goes to your knee. It loves your knee. Loves your knee. It likes your skin. So it causes skin lesions. It loves to go lodge itself in your skin. It likes those places. It likes your heart. Okay, it can cause endocarditis as well, rarer, much rarer, but it tends to be synovium and skin are the most common. So what will happen is as it's disseminating, you may get low-grade fevers, you may get some arthralgias, and then you come in with a red-hot knee. And this is the most common cause of a, a unilateral septic arthritis, usually knee, in sexually active people. The most common cause is gonorrhea, gonorrhea, gonorrhea. So keep that in mind. What you'll end up with the skin lesions that are basically little necrotic pustules that are on a red base. So if you'll see these, I'll tell you what they look like, and you've all seen this. So you've all seen MRSA. You've seen more MRSA than you could, you know, shake a stick at. If you see MRSA, yeah, MRSA is usually an isolated sort of skin lesion and little abscess. Sometimes people have multiple, but if you see 10 or 20, usually distal extremities, and gosh, this looks like a little MRSA abscess, what's up with that? Think gonorrhea. Okay, it's necrotic in the center. You can sort of swoop it out. It's kind of necrotic, and the base is very red. They make it a little, a little um, hemorrhagic as well. The way to diagnose this, and this is very logical, 
you need to basically try to get that organism. And the way to get it is to get where it went, so the knee if that's the problem, the skin if that's where the, what their symptom is, how it got there, the blood, and where it came from. So you're going to need to do cervix and, your, or, and or urethra. You're going to have to do pharynx and rectum. So any place it could have come from, how it got there, and where it went. That's what you have to basically send testing on all of those, and it's recommended cultures on all of those. And the treatment for this is ceftriaxone. Okay, it's easy. It's an easy treatment once you diagnose it. They don't have to get necessarily irrigated if it's a joint, they could, they, although they tend to get admitted to watch those. But this is easy to treat, ceftriaxone. That's how you treat this. So again, disseminated gonorrhea, that's how you treat it. These are what the lesions look like. So you've all seen little MRSA abscesses. They look like little tiny MRSA abscesses, except they're way too many. It's like, why are there 10 of them, or 8 of them, or 20 of them? And they're all in the distal extremities. It's because that's gonorrhea. That's why there's so many. This is, again, if you were to take a swab and swab that lesion, what you'd find is that in the middle is all mushy. And you can basically kind of swab that off, and it leaves this little crater. That's the necrotic pustule on the erythemidous base, that red base. That's gonorrhea. And by the way, those are positive. You can culture those. Those tend to be positive. Again, they can cause some um, blistering as well. If you ever see somebody, this isn't on the exam. This is just for you to be a super hot practitioner in the emergency department. If you see somebody who comes in with tenosynovitis on the hand with a bloody blister over, the, over that tendon, that's gonorrhea till proven otherwise. Okay, again, it likes synovium, not just your knee, it likes your, your synovium around your tendons, too. So it's another way to sort of pick it up. This is basically a gonococcal lesion. And this, you'll hear more about this in the Opville lecture, but if you see an eyeball that looks like that, that is not your run-of-the-mill bacterial conjunctivitis. It's bacterial, it's just the bad kind. It's gonorrhea. Now, the gonorrhea can get up in the upper genital tract as well, as can chlamydia, and they can cause pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, PID is a big problem. It is a big problem. By definition... It's an infection of the endometrium, fallopian tubes, or peritoneum alone or in combination. Basically, anything from the endometrium up in the female genital tract. And what tends, it tends to be not a single organism up there causing trouble. You know, the, the female genital tract has all kinds of normal organisms, lots and lots of bacteria that keep things healthy down there. Well, if they end up in the wrong place or out of balance or up where they don't belong, you can end up with gram negatives up there, you can end up with mycoplasma up there, ureoplasma up there, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. So it tends to be kind of this mishmash of all kinds of bacteria, meaning that a single drug is not going to be helpful in treating this. You're going to need multiple drugs to treat somebody who has PID. It can cause an abscess, we know that. It's one of the causes of basically abscesses out in the, in the tuba ovarian area. And the worry about this is that even when PID is mild, or God forbid, even asymptomatic, it can cause scarring. So those tubes that are supposed to be nice and patent, letting eggs kind of come down and everything beautiful, get kind of lumpy bumpy, and things get stuck out in the tubes, which increases the risk of ectopic pregnancy, and if it scars completely, increases the risk of infertility. A big problem. So when women get this, they can present anything from super sick and toxic, that tends to be the gonorrhea group, to I don't really have very many symptoms at all, except maybe sex is a little uncomfortable. That isn't usually, but yeah, last couple times it's been a little uncomfortable, to nothing. And you can still have scarring with any range of those presentations. Our goal in PID is to diagnose it with a very low threshold to diagnose it and treat it with our goal being to prevent all those complications down the line. Anything from chronic pelvic pain to chronic dyspareunia, all the way to ectopic pregnancy and infertility. We would like to prevent that. So, your diagnostic criteria for PID is clinical only. Okay, any testing is just confirmatory or helps you. But your diagnosis this of this is something you do clinically. So if you do a pelvic exam and it is more uncomfortable than what is normal for that woman, if you move her cervix around and she kind of cringes, it's like, does this usually feel like this? No, it's a little worse than usual. Or you go out to either adnexa and it's more tender than usual, boom, you're done. You diagnose PID and treat PID. Well, you treat PID. What you write on the chart is up to you, but you're going to treat that person as PID because they may be one of these low-grade infections that's minimally symptomatic. So it is a clinical diagnosis. Any other testing, SED rates, white counts, swabs, blah, 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 are all just secondary. You don't hinge your diagnosis based on those. Because what's happening up there is this. You've got all this pus up there in the upper, upper tract that's causing all kinds of scarring and infection. Now, what do you do once you've diagnosed it? Cool, I'm going to do the clinical thing. I'm going to try to prevent women's infertility. That's all great. 
but what do, what do I do? Who needs to be admitted? Well, clearly sick people need to be admitted. So that person who comes in febrile and toxic, and that person needs to be admitted. And you also want to make sure it's not something else, like an appy or something we're missing. So if they're sick, they stay. If they won't or can't take their meds, they stay. If you're worried about a compliance, they should stay. Some people recommend preteens and teens stay so that you can sort of preserve their fertility. I'm not sure we can do that routinely, but no, for sure, sick people stay. And the treatment itself, there are sort of two ways of doing it. There's the inpatient regimens and the outpatient regimens. I know for you at home, when you are not at ABEM General and you're back at your usual hospital, please look it up. It changes, it kind of evolves over time. This is the 2015 set of guidelines. Two inpatient options, three outpatient options. Um, know that this is evolving over time. And the one thing to notice um, on, oh, by the way, they're all 14-day treatments, so they're all two-week deals. But one thing to notice is that, is that, at least on the outpatient, there's metronidazole on there as the plus-minus. The reason metronidazole is, is, at, metronidazole is added is that this, there are some women who have not just gram-negatives up there, anaerobes up there, but also sometimes BV may be a, an, an entree into getting the actual PID itself. So if you have somebody with white cells, and or BV, when you're diagnosing PID, you're going to add the metronidazole. Or if they're sick, you're going to add the metronidazole. If they have an IUD, it comes out. If they have a partner, that partner should get treated. And the complications are what we're trying to prevent. So all this jazz on this list are what we're trying to prevent by having a low threshold to diagnose and treat PID. And this is all CDC recommendations across the board. Now, one of the things that can happen is those organisms, when they get kind of up into your sort of peritoneal area, they can track up your gutters, and they can go up and live around your liver. So chlamydia in particular, it can go up and kind of hang out around your liver, but the problem while it's hanging out around your liver is it irritates the liver capsule. And you get these basically violin string adhesions between the liver capsule and sometimes the diaphragm, sometimes the peritoneum, but it gets adhe adhesed in there. That's Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome, and the classic presentation of Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome is right upper quadrant pain, right upper quadrant tenderness, and normal LFTs, because your liver is fine. It's, uh, it's your liver capsule that's the problem. So that pus and stuff gets up there, causes this sort of problem along the surface of the liver, and the LFTs are usually normal. So the classic presentation for us, we, we are a, a cholecystitis and cholelithiasis center of excellence where I work. We can get certified in ultrasound for gallbladders in a single week at my institution. We see so many gallstones. It is unbelievable. So, so we're very used to the gallstone thing. Oh, it's another gallstone, another gallstone, except, wow, no gallstones. Or gallstones, normal LFTs. Or what's up with this? So think about Fitzhugh Curtis. Okay, it's treated like, like all the other sort of PID things, but think about Fitzhugh Curtis, because that, that may be how they present. All right, so that's the two STIs that we think of as STIs causing drips. Let's talk about the vulvovaginitides. So vulvovaginitis is basically an inflammation of the, of the sort of vulvae and vagina, or you know, both or either. And this can be anything from an irritant, like say your sexual partner uses latex condoms and you're latex allergic, you end up with an irritated vagina, or you have an infection. You have chlamydia, you have trick, you have BV. So, and, or you may have, you're, you're allergic to douches if, if it's a woman who uses douches or, or, or um, uh, tampons. Sometimes women have allergic to tampons. So lots of things that can do this, but we're going to focus on the infections themselves. We're going to start with trick. Now, trick is a sexually transmitted infection. This is something that two partners can pass to one another. And we've gone through intracellular organisms like chlamydia and bacteria like gonorrhea and viruses like herpes. This is a protozoa. So we now have a whole other category of things that you can pick up. This is a protozoal infection. And this tends to cause a malodorous, frothy discharge in women. It can be itchy, but not quite as itchy as, cl as uh, chlamydia ten or uh, uh, Canada tends to be. And the classic presentation of this, which of course if it's classic, it never happens in real life, but the classic presentation of this is the strawberry cervix. If you have a shift and you see a strawberry cervix, you look in there and basically it's a pus on the cervix with all the little glands and flames, so it looks like that picture down there. I want you to take your, get, finish your shift and go out and buy yourself a lottery ticket because you just saw something that is not very common. So a strawberry cervix is considered not pathognomonic, but pretty close for trick. And trick, because it's an STI, you're at risk for all the other sort of sexually transmitted stuff, HIV, HSV, et cetera. Men tend to be asymptomatic. Women tend to have some symptoms. This is what the little bugger looks like. And if you've ever seen this live on a slide, these little things are fast. They go pew, 
pew, across the slide. They're kind of remarkable. They're super fast. They look itchy just on the slide. They look incredibly itchy. Um, and what you're going to get when you send the wet mount to the lab is they're going to say trichomonal forms, or they'll say trick positive. That's what they'll say. The treatment for this is easy. Okay, it's metronidazole or tenetazole, super easy, single dose, not recommended to do topical stuff. And remember, Billy told you that if somebody's on metronidazole and they drink alcohol, they may end up with a disulfiram-like reaction again. That is like moths to the flame for an ABEM item writer. They love that question, so don't be surprised if it's on your, on your exam. Um, the, the, as far as treating sexual partners, this is one they recommend that you treat the sexual partner in. And the reason that the, it, it is a problem, if somebody's pregnant and has this, they have increased risk of premature rupture, increased preterm delivery, increased risk of low birth weight, it's a bad deal. So you need to treat it in pregnant women. Now the most common of the vulvovaginities is BV, without question, by tenfold, twentyfold, way more common. And we're a lot of the problem with this, okay? We give somebody antibiotics, they change their flora down there that's normal and balanced and lovely. We give them an antibiotic and change their flora and it gets replaced with Gardnerella and anaerobes. And they end up with basically a fishy smelling discharge. Um, it's not particularly itchy, can be, but it tends to be kind of a copious discharge, it just smells bad. Um, and when you send the wet mount, they have clue cells. These things called M cells diagnostic criteria do not apply for us in the ER. It's all great for studies. It doesn't help us in the ER. I mean, when's the last time you got a call from the lab and they said, we have a stat, stat, stat order here, stat, we have a stat result. We have a stat fishy odor up here in the lab, stat fishy odor. They don't call you with that. Okay, the patient may tell you that though. Okay, the patient may say, gosh, it smells kind of fishy down there. That th there, there is new testing coming out to help this, but right now we're stuck with sort of a clinical diagnosis. You're gonna send your wet mount, it's gonna come back with this, clue cells. This is an overgrowth of Gardnerella on the cells that you get with your wet mount. Treating is easy, easy, easy. Okay, this is metronidazole, this is in various forms. You can use a seven-day course, a five-day course, you can use a cream, very easy. But the things in red on this slide are vitally important. All pregnant patients with BV get treated. All symptomatic patients with BV get treated. An asymptomatic woman who just happens to have clue cells in her urine or on a swab does not get treated. Okay, the, and the, the goal of this is to not sort of push any sort of emergence of resistance. That's the CDC's a pretty strong recommendation on this. So all pregnant, all symptomatic, don't treat asymptomatic if you have clue cells. Now the last of the triumvirate here of the three vulvovaginities is candida. Candida is extraordinarily common. I'll tell you, if you have a patient who comes in and says, gosh, doctor, it's so itchy down there and I had this discharge. No, it doesn't smell bad, but it's super itchy. And you know what's so weird? It's the third time I've had this in the last six months. What's the most important test you're gonna get in that person? A blood glucose. This is really common in diabetics, extraordinarily common in diabetics. You are a nice yeast if you are, a, it's a great place for yeast to grow. I'm a nice sugary, warm area. So it's nice, my sugar is high, it's nice and warm. Yeast loves to grow there, it just loves it. What they'll end up with when they end up with yeast in the vulva vaginal area is it itches like a son of a gun. And they may scratch to the point of edema, sometimes even to bleeding, it's so, so itchy. And the discharge tends to be not odorous particularly, it's just super, super itchy. That sort of cottage cheesy kind of discharge is common. It's not 100% of the time, but common. Um, and it's, again, not odorous at all. And this is what you'll see. Okay, the way they'll have this kind of cottage cheesy, not smelly kind of discharge. And you're going to go send your wet mount, and they're going to basically say yeast forms is what you're going to get the report of. It's going to say yeast forms. And that's, again, super easy to treat. Flucon. Flucon, flucon, flucon. Single dose, done. And there are a gazillion over-the-counter ways to treat it as well. So they can go to the drugstore and talk to the pharmacist and say, I think I have a yeast infection again, and there's a bunch they can just buy at the drugstore. Um, in pregnancy, it's recommended topical treatment only, just so you know. This is what they're seeing upstairs. We don't see them downstairs anymore. We see you send everything to the lab. This is what they're seeing upstairs. So here's another sort of money slide for you. Everything all on one slide. So if you want to put all the vulvovaginities in one, vulvovaginities in one si slide, there you have it. It's all right there. All right, let's get to a couple mishmash things and then we'll get to a couple other gynecologic problems. Here's a Bartholin gland abscess. This, but the Bartholin glands are really important glands that live in the introitus and they basically help keep everything nice and lubricated. They're wonderful, but they can get gummed up and they can get infected. And, the, the, they come, and, and it's very interstitial tissue, so these things can get huge. They can get the size of a softball. If you see someone with a Bartholin gland abscessed, or even cyst, but abscessed for sure, what you do is drain it. And the best way to drain this is so you have the abscess that's sitting basically in the labia. What you're going to do is you're going to make your incision on the medial aspect of the labia. 
kind of near the introitus. And it doesn't have to be big. It could be punch incision. That's it, because the thing drains like crazy. But then you need to have that big empty space, keep that sort of spot you cut open. So you put this ward catheter in there. And the reason that you're going to make your cut on the medial aspect near the introitus is that catheter has to stay in for six weeks. Well, having something hang out down there for six weeks is kind of a drag. So if you had the cut near the introitus, you can tuck that catheter up inside the vagina so it's not causing discomfort for the woman. So that's the ward catheter. Don't need antibiotics for this. Once you've drained it, you don't unless they're systemically ill. That's the way to treat this thing with the ward catheter and IND. Now, condyloma lata we talked about with syphilis. This is condyloma acuminata. This is the one that's the HPV. This is the one that we can actually prevent by giving our kids a vaccine. So this is basically a DNA virus, this is HPV, it's spread by direct contact like most warts are, and it takes a long time to grow. Your chicky 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 card today isn't gonna be symptomatic for three months if you pick up HPV today. And what you end up with are these painless warts on your genitalia, anything from a single to multiple, multiple matted warts that you can get. And it can be anywhere that you're inoculated, perineal, per on the penis, on the, around the vaginal opening, anywhere. The reason this is important and the reason that vaccination is being pushed is it turns out this little bugger, this HPV, is probably that causes the vast majority of cervical cancer. So it turns out cervical cancer is probably starts with an infection of HPV. So this is a, a huge cause of cervical cancer. Treating the warts once you have them is a nightmare. It takes a long time. It, it's nothing we would do in the ER. They need to be burned off. Or they need to, there's all kinds of ways to cryotherapy. It takes a long time. There's no pill that cures this. This is all local therapy. But prevention is key. It's one of the reasons that we, it's emphasized to, treat, to, to prevent this in, in um, pre-adolescent, actually, kids. So this is what they look like, and that could look a lot like a condylomalata. Again, remember, the two are hard to tell apart one from the other. So just know that's sort of the last of this sort of lesions that can, can come down on the genitalia. Let's crawl up a little bit into the upper female genital tract and let's go out to the ovaries. Ovarian cysts are very common, but they're rarely symptomatic. So they're super common, but they don't usually get symptomatic until they're bigger. So three centimeters or, or more is when they tend to be symptomatic. And your, and your ovarian cycle, your menstrual cycle, the first part of your cycle is to basically make a follicle mature to pop out an egg, which is middle schmerz, right? Right in the middle of my menstrual cycle, I pop out an egg. Then after that, that what was the follicle needs to make a corpus luteum just in case you get pregnant and it needs to support that developing fetus by producing some progesterone. So in your menstrual cycle, you can have, you can have cysts, anything from a follicular cyst, which is just fluid full of clear liquid, it's the egg waiting to pop itself out, or a corpus luteum cyst, which tends to be more vascular, and that tends to be the second half of the menstrual cycle. The, the follicular cysts rarely can cause anything life-threatening. The corpus luteum cysts absolutely can be life-threatening. And the, so here's your cycle, by the way. So the first half is making the follicle. The second half is making is the follicular cyst that's waiting on that thing. Here's what they look like. The follicle's nice and, you know, those eggs are in there waiting to try to make a baby. It pops out. But that, if that thing pops, it doesn't cause a lot of trouble. If that thing pops, it does. This is the corpus luteum, and as it starts to get bigger and bigger, it is vascular, and this thing can basically end up looking exactly like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy if it pops, but your pregnancy test is negative. You can bleed and bleed and bleed from a corpus luteum cyst. So ovarian cysts come in kind of two flavors. Follicular can get big and they can pop, but they don't usually cause a life threat. Corpus luteum can get big and they're vascular, and if they pop, they can. Now, well, either of those can torse, but what's more common to torse is a dermoid. So a dermoid cyst is basically an embryonic thing. Those are the ones that have the teeth and the hair, and they can get kind of huge um, in there. They're kind of amazing. Those tend to twist. Dermoids tend to twist. What's interesting is that ovarian cancer doesn't tend to twist. Ovarian cancer doesn't twist because it tends to start to, it, to infiltrate tissues around it early, and it gets kind of stuck. So it tends not to flip, flip around on itself. So ovarian torsion or ad, ad, um, adnexal torsion is dermoid cysts usually or larger cysts, and they present with unilateral adnexal pain, usually pretty severe with nausea and vomiting. And it's severe because, and nausea and vomiting because it's basically necrotic. It's getting necrosed. It's, it has no blood supply. So they come in feeling terrible. One of the weird things about ovarian cysts, though, compared to, to, to um, testicular torsion, is that ovar ovaries can torse and detorse. You know, testicular torsion tends to be at least once and usually actually twice around, and it can be as many as three times around. 
So once it's twisted, it tends to stay twisted. The ovary doesn't, it tends to kind of flop back and forth rather than truly doing these loop-de-loops that tend to happen with the testicles. So for women, they may end up torsing and detorsing. Our ultrasound is the diagnostic test of choice, but if they have it flipped back and they're actually perfusing, your ultrasound can be falsely negative for somebody that has torsed. So know that that's a potential problem. But ultrasound is the way to go flat out to diagnose this. Here's a torsion. It's flipped around on its base. So this is something that's causing a lot of pain, usually relatively acute and onset, nausea and vomiting. That's a necrosing organ. Now endometriosis is a little different story. Endometriosis is where some of your endometrium has spit out and it's sitting somewhere it shouldn't be. So your endometrium is sitting outside your uterus and it's sitting attacking your, you know, inside your tube. It's sitting out on your peritoneum. It's causing all kinds of trouble with lots and lots of pain. It can get anywhere. And I know that Stuart talked to you guys about when it can get in the pleura and cause catamenial pneumothorax. You can get them just about anywhere. For us, endometriosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. We, if somebody comes in with a lot of pelvic discomfort, a lot of pelvic pain, or they have new dyspareunia or something where it's in the differential, we're going to worry about the other stuff first the infections first, or the TOA first, or some, the, the ectopic pregnancies. We're about all that other stuff first. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. So this is not something we usually actually diagnose in the ER, but it is an entity that can present to us with people with pelvic pain. What we see much more often are lyomyomas, or fibroids. Fibroids are, uh, they're these just balls of muscle tissue from the uterus itself. They can be in the wall, they can be sticking out from the wall, they can be sticking inside the cavity itself, they can have a, a neck on them and a pedicle on, they're just kind of amazing things in there. They're usually benign. Okay, sometimes they're lyomyosarcomas, but usually they're not. Usually they're just fibroids. They are the most common pelvic tumor by far, and they can get enormous. We've all seen it, right? We've all seen the woman who has a nine-month fibroid uterus. They can get enormous. Usually African-American women are more commonly get the big ones, but it can happen to anybody. And they present with pelvic pain and often abnormal bleeding. Okay? They, can, they, they often present with anemia because they just have lots of abnormal bleeding as a result. The diagnos diagnostic test of choice for this is ultrasound. The absolutely ultrasound. And these things can grow fast, especially early in pregnancy. So if somebody, gets, somebody has a fibroid, and now they get pregnant, and their hormones go crazy because they're pregnant, that fibroid can grow fast. And sometimes it grows so fast, it outgrows its blood supply, and it can get necrotic. That, again, is diagnosable by ultrasound. But know that if these things go super fast or twist on a sort of pedicle that's holding it on, they can actually necrose. So know that these can outgrow their blood supply. Treatment initially is just non-steroidals for this for pain. Eventually, maybe hormone therapy, sometimes surgery. Now, if we want to drift away from this sort of benign tumors into the malignant ones, we're going to drift into uterine cancer. So uterine cancer is the most common, co common type of gynecologic cancer. And your clinical clue for uterine cancer is postmenopausal bleeding. In a woman who's potent, now menopause by definition is one year after the last menstrual period. So it's not the little weird spotting that happens as women get near menopause. This is actually my last bleeding I ever had was two years ago. And now I'm spotting again. That is uterine cancer till proven otherwise. The um, average age at diagnosis is, is 58, so it tends to be women in their late 50s, early 60s. And there's some risk factors for this, but just know your clinical clue is postmenopausal bleeding. Sometimes their uterus is bigger than it should be when you go to do your exam, but may not be. And this is something you're going to refer right away to get them worked up because they're growing something in there that needs to actually get scraped out and diagnosed. Versus ovarian cancer, which is about the same age range, but this is a little bit more problematic because ovarian cancer is usually advanced at the time of diagnosis. The ovaries are sitting down there in the pelvis, and they have lots of room to grow and do bad stuff before the symptoms start. And the symptoms that women tend, the most common symptom that women who have ovarian cancer present with is bloating. That is a really non-specific symptom. And lots of people have bloating, whatever. You know, I just feel kind of bloated. It's a big problem. And, and I'll tell you, your clinical clue here is ascites in a woman who has no other reason to have ascites. She's not an alcoholic. There's, you know, she doesn't have any known liver disease. And she has ascites. That's ovarian cancer till proven otherwise. So ascites in women, if they don't have any other reason to have ascites, that's ovarian cancer until proven otherwise. And if they have ascites, it's a terrible thing. They're way down the line as far as diagnosis. So this is the other of the two big sort of cancers that we tend to see in the ER. This is ascites with no known reason versus postmenopausal bleeding, which is the uterine cancer. 
Now, cervical cancer we see as well, and I'll tell you, we hardly ever see this anymore. Um, between all the pap smears that have been done in this world of women getting their routine checkups with the HPV vaccine that's coming down the pike that a lot of the sort of young, young people have been vaccinated for, this is decreasing in its, in its sort of likelihood. Although I will tell you, I still see people dying of cervical cancer because I see a lot of immigrants in my patient population and they have never had a pap smear in their lives and they come in to see me when they're having weird bleeding and they have kidney problems because this cancer has basically obstructed their ureters and so this still definitely can occur it is preventable and it is hpv related that's why the vaccine is important if you see it you do an exam and you see the cervix looks really gnarly that's something you're going to refer right away to get a biopsy so they can get that thing treated now let's get to vaginal bleeding let's get away from this the sort of tumors and the sad stuff let's get to vaginal bleeding and you know when somebody comes into the emergency department and their chief complaint is vaginal bleeding your initial split is pregnant non-pregnant Okay, pregnant, you're going to do one thing, non-pregnant, you're going to do another. So that non-pregnant vaginal bleeder, there's lots of causes. First, make sure it's from the vagina itself. It's not something that's your, you know, urinary, urinary or rectal. And it can be related to the, uh, over the menstrual cycle itself, related to ovulation, menometrorrhagia, or anovulatory. They just bleed like crazy. Okay, they just didn't, their hormones are totally out of whack. Our job, honestly, in these cases is if they're super sick, we treat them super sick. If they're not, and they're usually not, right? They're usually, I'm a little tired because my hemoglobin is seven. Okay, it should be 12, it is seven, I'm tired. Okay, those people can either, often don't even get transfused at that point, they get referred and then get a workup as an outpatient. They don't, if they're, rarely do we ever have to do anything in the ER for non-pregnant vaginal bleeding. Right? Transfusions are the only thing that we really do. And as far as hormone manipulation, we don't tend to do it in the ER. And I'll tell you, the older the woman, the less likely you should. Over the age of 35, it's really recommended not to give them hormones until they see an OBGYN and get some testing done. Let's go to babies. I'm going to be a grandma soon. I'm very excited. It's the first one in my family. So let's talk about obstetrics. Normal pregnancy. Okay, urine, so basically, egg meets sperm. They shake hands. They join. It implants in the uterus, and your pregnancy test is positive like that. Our pregnancy tests are incredibly, incredibly sensitive. Urine pregnancy tests are positive within a week of implantation, often sooner. A couple other landmarks as far as pregnancy. Your, your HCG should double every 48 hours-ish. So that's nice. So if my, if my HCG is, is 1,000 on Monday, it should be 2,000 on Wednesday, it should be 4,000 on Friday, it should be 8,000 on Sunday. I should be, that's a normal progression of a beta, so that's really nice to know. And women who are pregnant may have breast tenderness, they have nausea, vomiting sometimes, and the other landmark to know is that when they are at 20 weeks, that fundus is at their belly button. Okay, that, that's actually really helpful for you. If you have somebody who comes in seizing or altered and they have a, a uterus up to there, that's a potentially viable baby, so that's kind of important to know. Now, if a pregnancy goes wrong early, it can be an abortion. And it's anything from a threatened abortion, which is bleeding and or pain, with an os that's closed at less than 20 weeks. If everything's closed and everything's still kind of hanging out in there, that's a threatened abortion. They get vaginal rest and they basically normal activity. So nothing goes in there, but they can walk and talk and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Nothing really can change that. An inevitable abortion is when they're bleeding and or pain and their os is open. Okay, everything's still up there, but it's not going to stay there. Okay, the os is open. They're less than 20 weeks. Those people, either they let them go until it passes on their own, or they'll do a DNC. Incomplete is bleeding with something still in there, either tissue with the ox, os, or products of conception still up inside, and that's something often dnc because it just isn't, fin it isn't solving itself. Do know that if you ever learn the terms blighted ovum, or intrauterine fetal demise, those now fall under the category of incomplete abortion. So the OBGYN society has kind of put it into that category as far as how they approach it. Our biggest worry is ectopic pregnancy. Now, I will tell you across the board, ectopic pregnancy is one in 50 pregnancies in the United States. One in 50. That is an unbelievable number. That is remarkable. The risk factors for having an ectopic are to be sexually active in this day and age. Basically, half of women with an ectopic, we have no identifiable reason that they have it. However, certain people are at much higher risk. If they've had an ectopic before, if they've had a history of PID before, if they've had a tubal and they still get pregnant, the odds are it is not where it belongs because those tubes have been, have been damaged. So those, or pelvic surgery and they get pregnant. So these are people that are at increased risk, but no, half of people have no identifiable reason to have an ectopic pregnancy. It's usually five to eight weeks after the last normal menstrual period that they'll come in and they can come in with either bleeding 
or pain, and or pain, or if they full-on rupture, they can end up critically ill with hemorrhagic shock. So often we see them before that, bleeding and or pain. You basically, either of those, in somebody who's first trimester pregnant, they warrant a quantitative beta HGG and an ultrasound. Okay, both. They warrant both. The level of ultrasound, the level of beta HCG quant, you need to pair with what your ultrasound shows to give you an idea of what's happening in there. So here's what a normal ultrasound looks like in a first trimester pregnancy. There is the, the gestational sac, that is the, the um, yolk sac in there, that round thing. And actually at about four o'clock, you see those two white lines? That's a fetal pole. This is a baby growing where it belongs. That's a baby in the uterus itself. If you want to look at that baby, transvaginally is the best way. Transvaginal basically is the end of your probe is literally centimeters away from that baby that's developing. So you get a really good picture early. Four weeks you can get something usually, so it's early. And what you're going to do is pair what your ultrasound shows with what your quantitative beta HCG is. So if my quantitative beta HCG is over 1,500, which is the magic number, 1,500, magic, magic number, I should see something in the uterus on a transvaginal ultrasound. Even if it's just a little blip of an early gestational sac, I should see something. If there is nothing there, it's just, a, just an endometrial stripe and nothing else, and my quant is 1,600, that's an ectopic pregnancy. I may not see it right now, but it's growing where it shouldn't be. That's an ectopic pregnancy. That's actually diagnostic 97% accurate. So no, the combination of your quantitative and your ultrasound result will give you an idea of sort of where to go as far as your, your um, ectopic pregnancy risk. Sometimes you're going to get an ultrasound that's going to show you that bottom right picture, which is one in, one out. That tends to be, the heterotopic pregnancy tends to be women who've had some sort of fertility. So testing. So usually it's actually ovarian stimulation, but any sort of fertility assistance tends to be the group that gets one in, one out. It's about one in 400 or so pregnancies that's a, an assisted pregnancy. Diagnosing this. If you have somebody who has vaginal bleeding and or pain, they're in their first trimester, you get an ultrasound and it shows an IUP. That is an IUP unless they have uh, has some sort of uh, manipulation because they're in infer infertility stuff, that is an IUP, things are probably good to go. Things are fine. If you have an empty uterus and a quantitative beta HCG over 1,500, that's an ectopic. If you have an identifiable fetal pole and uh, or, excuse me, yolk sac in the adnexa, that's an ectopic. Anything else, I've got a little bit of free fluid. I see maybe a little gestational sac. I, the ovaries look kind of normal. I have a quantitative of 800. The patient's otherwise stable. I don't know yet. Okay, that's the person you're going to put in the beta book and bring back in two days, or if they're feeling really sick, you're going to keep them around and watch them. Okay, the serial, serial betas and or keep them around if they're particularly sick. So here's what the ectopic can look like on ultrasound. That thing on the right that's surrounded by green is the endometrium. The thing surrounded by red is the uterus, and that thing that's surrounded by yellow is a baby growing where it shouldn't be. Okay, that's an ectopic pregnancy. Now, if you diagnose an ectopic pregnancy, it used to basically be they took, your uter they took your tube, they took your ovary, and then they realized they didn't have to do that, and now sometimes they just take your tube. Now, what they really like to do is open it if they have to do surgery and just take out the pregnancy and try to sew it up and let you keep your tube, and better yet, if you qualify, if you have all the right kind of criteria, they can give you methotrexate and not do any surgery at all. So all of those are options as far as treating an ectopic pregnancy. So no, all of those are an option. Just do know, though, that the methotrexate has a failure rate up to one-third. So methotrexate isn't effective across the board. And every once in a while, we'll see that person in the ER who comes back to the emergency department knowing they have an ectopic, that got diagnosed, that it's for sure an ectopic, and they're day two after their methotrexate with terrible adnexal pain. Is it because that, ba that base, the, the baby that's growing in the wrong places is now involuting, it's, it, it's dying, or is it because they've ruptured that ectopic pregnancy? You have to be kind of on the ball with the methotrexate group. Fortunately, most OBGYNs that use methotrexate are all over this, and they take very good care of these patients. Now, Rogam. Rogam's gotten a little bit of controversy in sort of the podcast world lately, but no, for ABEM general, you are going to give Rogam to RH negative mothers who have any kind of trauma, you know, that might have basically caused some sort of, you know, crossing of the baby's blood into mom's, or any, any type of sort of threatened miscarriage or ectopic pregnancy. 
If they're less than 12 weeks in, as far as their, their IUP duration, it's going to be 50. If they're more than 12 weeks, it's going to be 300. So know that, that basically Rogam is what you definitely need to get in, at ABAM General. So those are the gist on that. Now, pregnancies themselves, they can go wrong. Molar pregnancies, your clinical clue to a molar clues to a molar pregnancy or someone who comes in and says, wow, I'm only six weeks pregnant, and look, I'm already showing. Shouldn't show at six weeks. And their quant is 250,000 at six weeks. Shouldn't be that way. And they've had a lot of hyperemesis. They've been barfing a lot. Some people do, but boy, that's just a lot of things all at once. That basically is trophoblastic tissue that isn't forming a baby. It's forming all these little things that look like bubbles in the uterus. So size greater than eight dates, HCG greater than you'd expect, and barfing, throwing up a lot, makes you worry about somebody with basically a molar pregnancy. Ultrasound shows this, this sort of snowstorm appearance, and when they do a DNC, this is what comes out, it's trophoblastic tissue. It's, it, it, once they clean all that out, the woman can go on and have a normal pregnancy, but this, need, this has got to come out of there. Okay, this is basically a molar pregnancy. Now, as we get to the end of the pregnancy, we're getting now babies coming, how exciting is this? A couple things can go wrong at that point as well. Abruption, and Billy actually referred to this a little bit already once, abruption is where the placenta, and usually in the sec end of the second or third trimester, pulls away from the uterine wall and bleeds between it. So you have now blood between the, where the placenta is pulled away and the uterine wall itself. Now that can be contained where this placenta is still all around this part that's pulled away, or it can actually be free into the actual uterine cavity itself if it's pulled out and now the bleeding is actually into the uterine cavity. I was taught that people with abruption have dark red vaginal bleeding. Well, they might if they have one where it actually bleeds into the uh, uterine cavity itself. If it's contained, though, they're not going to have any bleeding at all. But one thing that they all have is your uterus doesn't like blood underneath there, and you basically get lots of pain, and you can get a hypertonic uterus. Now, who gets abruption? It can happen with trauma for sure, and that can be anything as minor as bumping your big belly against the edge of a counter to a massive MVA. It can also happen, though, spontaneously. And this is the cocaine user, and this is the hypertensive mom. Okay, those are the people that can have, so I, la, 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 everything is fine. I know I have hypertension. Ooh, gosh, it really hurts. And oh, my uterus is really hard. And oh, my gosh, it's really painful. That is an abruption. Okay, that's an abruption. You got to monitor the baby for fetal distress. Ultrasound is not good at picking this up. You would think it'd be great, but it just isn't. Ultrasound is not good at picking this thing up. So here it is. It's torn away, and that number one is showing you a contained abruption. It's stuck there. It hasn't gotten out into anywhere where you'd see blood below. It's a contained abruption, and it's okay to do a pelvic exam in this person because there's nothing you're going to cause any worse at a pelvic exam here. It's fine to do a pelvic if it's indicated in this person. Versus previa. Previa, now that placenta is draped over the exit. That placenta is draped where that baby's got to go to get out. And that, you know a placenta is this incredibly blood-filled organ. It is a remarkable thing, the placenta. It's an amazing thing. But you don't want it where if it starts to bleed, your whole blood supply can go that way. That's the problem with Previa, is it's sitting over the cervical os. If it bleeds, it's bright red. And this is something you do not want to put anything in that uterus because right above that cervix is that basically red tide of a, of a placenta waiting to cut loose. So nothing goes in, in the vagina of a woman you think has placenta previa. And the previa is very easy to diagnose on ultrasound because they can get right down here with the ultrasound probe and look right at the cervix itself. You'll see the placenta draped right over it. So here on the, on the right side here is previa. Normally, your placenta tends to be high in your uterus. Here, it's decided to basically drape over the exit sign. And here's what an ultrasound looks like. My placenta is over the cervix. It basically is over where that baby needs to go. And you can see why bright red blood can end up coming out of that uterus. So nothing goes in the vagina in a previa, bright red blood, low, low placenta. In an abruption, they tend to have lots of pain. Ultrasound's not particularly helpful. And if you have to do a pelvic, it's fine. Now, pregnancy-induced hypertension, please don't memorize any numbers except 140 over 90. If you have any pregnant person, I don't care what ABEM general throws at you, if it's an ABEM general patient with an ankle sprain that comes in to see you, and they have in the vital signs a blood pressure of 140 over 90, you're going to worry about pregnancy-induced hypertension. And you're not necessarily going to do anything about it, but call the OBGYN, but know that that is a significant problem in people that are pregnant. What we don't want it to do is progress. And we don't want it to progress to preeclampsia. Now, if you, for your last concert exam, memorize certain criteria for preeclampsia, you're going to have to erase a couple things. 
edema, ankle edema, is no longer a criterion for preeclampsia. Preeclampsia's definition now is a 20-week or greater gestation with a blood pressure 140 over 90 plus either proteinuria, and for us it's a 1 plus dip in the ER, or evidence of some end organ dysfunction. And there's your list. Low platelets, a little bit of an LV creatinine, all those things. Know that this could be somebody you're seeing for an ankle sprain or a minor injury who's 25 weeks pregnant, and if her blood pressure is 145 over 95, and she has a creatinine of 1.4, she's preeclamptic. Okay, so know that the criteria is different than what it used to be. Ankle swelling is no longer a criterion. But now the definition is a little bit different. There are women that are at risk for sure. Okay, primogravida is definitely at risk. People at extremes of age and pregnancy, definitely at risk. Molar pregnancy, multiple pregnancies, multiple gestations, all inc increased risk here. And the symptoms when they get them tend to be headache, maybe some visual blurriness, visual changes, edema, and some usually epigastric or right upper quadrant pain. If that person with that elevated creatinine and elevated blood pressure with a little nausea and right upper quadrant pain now seizes, that's eclampsia. They cross the threshold and they are truly eclamptic. And they tend to get head problems. They get brain problems as a result. If they've seized, the, basically the treatment for this is, is magnesium, magnesium, magnesium. You can use benzos as well, but ABEM General is going to want you to say magnesium. So magnesium is the way to treat, and you're going to watch them for hypermagnesemia. The, the, it's, it's a, the other thing to know about preeclampsia and eclampsia is that it not only can occur in the last sort of end of second trimester, third trimester, it can also occur up to 10 weeks after birth. So another classic ABEM general potential question would be to have a new dad holding an infant next to the bed of a woman seizing. You need to recognize new baby seizing mother might be eclampsia. Okay, so recognize that. Now, one of the other weird things that can happen is HELP syndrome, which basically in its name tells you the problem. Basically, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets. That's the HELP syndrome. It is an preeclampsia sort of version. It tends to be in people that are multigravitous, tends to be people that have had babies before. It's a diagnostic test by labs, and I'll tell you, if your lab on your CBC says schistocytes, first of all, no one should have schistocytes. Nobody. Nobody. Schistocytes for you are something bad in that person, and you just have to track it down. If she happens to be in her third trimester pregnancy, you've got to worry about HELP syndrome in here. And the treatment for preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP is to deliver that baby. To get that baby out of there is the treatment, uh, sort of overall, the curative treatment is to deliver that baby. Now, you heard a little bit about appendicitis from Amala this morning to know that this is the most common surgical diagnosis in pregnancy. So know that we can get fooled in this. The, the fool, the, basically, we get fooled calling it pilo. Just know appendicitis, you don't want it to rupture. It increases the risk of preterm delivery. So worry about appendicitis in the right clinical scenario in pregnancy. You heard about it this morning. UTI is very common in pregnancy. The other thing to know about UTIs in pregnancy is they all have to get treated. So UTIs, even, even cystitis in pregnancy, needs to get treated because if you don't, it increases the risk of basically preterm labor, it increases the risk of fetal wastage, basically losing the baby. And if they end up with pilo, it's even worse. So the risk is even higher with pilo. In fact, to the point where most pregnant pilo patients get either OBS or admitted to get watched until that th they basically turn around. The treatment is sort of the cephalosporin, amoxicillin, nitrofurantoin group, but know that all UTIs in pregnancy get treated. Now, drugs in pregnancy are something that we sort of think about a lot. Is it safe or not to use certain things in pregnancy? Right now, we see the minifins getting a lot of bad press out in the real world. The reality is there is a list of medicines that you can use safely in pregnancy. This is not an, an, a comprehensive list, but for the things that you might need in the ER, these are the things you can use. Across the board, most antibiotics are okay. There are a few that aren't. We'll talk about in a sec, particularly the, the fluoroquinolones. Antiemetic list here. Here's some vaccines, not live vaccines, but basically the non-live vaccines. Asthma, you treat the same in pregnancy as you do if they're not pregnant. Hypertension, virtually everything is okay except ACE inhibitors, ACEs and ARBs. Um, anticoagulants, only heparin, not Coumadin. Okay, and forget the new drugs. We don't know yet anything about those. Antivirals are fine. There's a miscellaneous list for you here as well. This is easier, the contraindicated list. The aspirin nonsteroidals are third trimester primarily. ACE inhibitors, aminoglycosides, and warfarin, absolutely not. Okay, not in pregnancy. And anticonvulsants are a whole different ballgame. That's something that a neurologist needs to talk about.
Now, we'll end up with labor itself and sort of things that go on with labor. Preterm labor is any labor before 37 weeks. And, that, and your job basically is if you think someone's in preterm labor is to get them to a place that has L&D. If it's your own hospital, great. If it's not, get them to wherever they need to go to their own hospital. If you do need to do an exam, it needs to be sterile. Okay, if they're having, oh, gosh, I think I may have passed my, broken my water, then make sure that it's sterile. Because if they're preterm, they're going to try to keep that baby in there as long as they can safely. So don't introduce any more bacteria than are already in there as it is. Now, premature rupture of membranes definitely happens. So someone will say, I think I peed myself, but I didn't have to pee first, and now there's all this liquid. What's going on down there? PROM, premature rupture of membranes, may be what happens. This is basically where they rupture before you even labor yet. So all the fluid is out now, and that's a problem. Again, nothing goes in there. Don't put your fingers in there, no speculum. You're going to consider examining that fluid, and go find that nitrazine paper. If you have an LND, they have it up there. If you don't, go ahead and grab the sort of pH paper you have. It's not quite as good as nitrazine paper, but close. And if the pH is basically alkaline, that's, bas that, that's amniotic fluid, and that's something you have to worry about premature rupture. These people basically need to go to L&D, and they often try to keep the baby in there if they can. They may put, they get the bed rest. This is a big deal. So if you think somebody has PROM, get them to an L&D. What you don't want to see is somebody who go, who's delivering in your, we've had two babies delivered recently in our ER. They just randomly tend to happen. But if you have somebody who's laboring, and you take a peek in there, and what you see is what looks like a purple knuckle, that's a prolapsed cord. And that's bad news, because that baby's head is going to basically suffocate itself by t cutting off its own blood supply. If you have somebody with a prolapsed cord, you're going to put her knee chest, butt in the air, chest down, knee chest. You're going to basically push that baby's head back up inside, feeling to f for a pulse in that cord, and you're going to get that baby, get that woman to the L&D as soon as you possibly can. Now, one of the awful things to hear is code blue L&D. Code blue L&D. It's like one of your worst nightmares ever. One of the things that can be caused in code blue L&D is an amniotic fluid embolism. This tends to happen soon after delivery, sometimes C-section, sometimes spontaneous delivery. Second and third trimesters can even be somebody who's delivering early. And what happens is you get a big bolus of amniotic fluid into the mother's blood supply. And I will tell you, it's already bad enough because it's an embolism. And it's just like a PE as far as what it does when it travels wherever it goes, which tends to be your lungs. As it gets there, it causes you know, hypotension, hypoxia, tachypnea, tachycardia, that whole thing. But amniotic fluid is full of baby's cells, baby's poop cells, baby's skin cells, and that's all tissue thromboplastin. And what happens is your body, the woman's body, she goes into raging DIC. So it is a highly mortal peri-delivery Cat catastrophe in somebody who's delivered. So amniotic fluid embolism, shock, dyspnea, hypoxia, ARDS, and DIC. Huge mortality, 50% in an hour. Terrible, terrible stuff. Now, if you have delivered a baby in the ER and everything is good, and you've handed off the baby, and you turn around and the mother is hemorrhaging, a couple of things have happened. One is she may have uterine atony, where her uterus is basically like, God, I've been so big for nine months. I'm just, let me rest for just a minute. Just let me rest for a second. You can't let it rest for a second. This is the reason the midwife will take the, this part of her hand and will just rub on, on the uterus of somebody who's just had a baby because you want that uterus to clamp down and it will basically stop the bleeding. If it doesn't, you're going to need to get Pitocin and you're going to need to basically rub the heck out of that thing. And if they rupture their uterus, now all bets are off. They can bleed to death. And this is the P, basically the feedback, the people who've had a C-section and now they have a vaginal delivery. It's rare, but it can occur. If somebody has retained products, they have a risk of infection. So if somebody comes in after they've delivered a couple days ago, especially if it's not been in a hospital kind of situation and they look sick and they have infection and they're bleeding, we're worried about retained products. Those people, again, go to the operating room. You can have lacerations that bleed. One of the worst cases I ever took care of is a woman who basically had basically split her cervix during delivery but had a uterine artery bleed. And your uterine artery at term is the size of your thumb. It's huge. It's huge, you have one on each side. And she went on to, I've never seen anybody bleed like that. We took every possible you know, ABD pads and put them up in there. As, we put a Foley in there and pulled it down and blew it up. And try, we tried everything to get her to stop bleeding. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. That's what can happen with lacerations of the lower genital tract. Coagulopathy can bleed, and God forbid it's uterine inversion, which is a misnomer. Uterine inversion is where you have placenta accreta. Your placenta, placenta doesn't want to come out of there. And somebody pulls on it, and what it does is basically everts the uterus, and it comes out here with the placenta still intact. That's called inversion. I think it's kind of a misnomer. But never pull on an umbilical cord if, it, if the placenta's not coming out on its own. Something's not right in there. Trauma and pregnancy you're going to hear in detail from Billy. 
Just know the magic, and he'll, so he'll get into detail, but know the magic here is a term pregnant woman who comes in, in a, as a trauma, strapped to a backboard like a turkey, has baby, uterus, and placenta lying on her IVC. What you're going to IVC. What you're going to want to do is take her and turn her onto her left side, or have somebody push that whole big belly off her IVC. And you may take a hypotensive, looking like she's crashing trauma patient, and make her look totally normal. So know that that's a big problem in, in pregnancy. And Billy will give you some more details later. Perimortem C-section. Basically, just know if a, if a mother dies right around the time that the, ba in a, the baby is viable, if you are to do a perimortem C-section. You have the, the likelihood, increased likelihood of saving the mom, especially in trauma, increased likelihood of saving the baby, but you have a four-minute window, period. Four-minute window. Rare to ever do. So make sure the baby's viable above the umbilicus. Make sure if the mom's getting CPR, it's really good. Depends why the mom died. You know, if it's a trauma thing, a head injury, you might want to get that baby out and see if you can save the baby. Terrible stuff. This is basically a vertical incision. No fan and steel bikini stuff here. This is a big deal. Last slide. Endometritis. This is somebody who gets an infection in the actual uterine cavity. We talked about PID at the beginning. That's endometritis from a sexually acquired, usually, infection. This is somebody who's delivered a baby, and now they've had goop in there, and they get an infection. They come in sick. I'll tell you, this is the person who had premature rupture, who had lo a long labor. They come in sick. They have a foul-smelling discharge, usually. They are peritoneal, and they end up very febrile. They're toxic. They look terrible. IV antibiotics, get them upstairs. And then the last thing that can happen is mastitis. Very, very common in breastfeeding women. Extraordinarily common. Treated with cephalosporins. Okay, they'll present with a red, hot breast, sometimes even just a quadrant of the breast. The key here is continue to breastfeed or pump or whatever. Continue that milk flow. That's fine. It's a staph infection. You treat it with cephalosporins. Never cut it. Okay, do not cut it. Okay, don't IND it yourself. If that needs to be done, that can be done by a surgeon. Rarely, if ever needed, it's usually antibiotics. So that's what it looks like. Very red, hot, tender breast. Easily to treat. Again, they continue breastfeeding and give them antibiotics. We have covered the stem to stern female genital tract. Thank you very much. <laughs>